Hello. Um, I guess you have the burden of being the last one of the day, when everyone has said all the interesting, exciting things I have to say. So let's see if um, I'm going to wrap this up so we can actually get to the interesting discussion bit and see if I can find anything new to tell you. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that there is not enough models um, being in design. Unfortunately, I have to agree and disagree. On the one hand, I have no model in this presentation, which is a thought that hopefully I didn't want to burden you with more models at this stage. Um, <coughs> But coming to that a bit later on, I have to out myself as well that I'm not a service designer. I don't consider myself to be one, but um, I'm actually not a designer as well in the classical sense. But I'm a researcher and a strategist, so I hope to bring a bit of a different perspective on things. So um, sitting down with my colleagues this morning to prepare this talk, we had a couple of thoughts about what we think is service and design and what the kind of two things come together. And just a few thoughts about us. We, I work for a company called Gravity, and we kind of at the intersection between design and innovation. And as the whole conglomerate comes together, we also kind of try to push things forward a bit. So the first thing we did, we said, OK, what does service mean in general? Because you know, being scientifically thorough, as we should be in this context, no one actually cared to kind of have a definition of the sense. So we said, OK, what does it mean for us? Um, is this a service or is this a product? And what is it? And how does this actually work? What do I get here? And what do I expect to get at the end? So we're kind of juggling balls a bit, you know, trying to see what's going to happen. And then we thought about new services, maybe like mobility. What does it mean? What does it mean? Because every car manufacturer right now is trying to move on from being a producer of goods and becoming a producer or a supplier of mobility. And if they want to do that, how does it work? But you know, me taking my card and logging into a Drive Now car, is that service? Is it a product? What is it? And what happens in between? And what is when the two things kind of come together? Where is the realm? Um, ideally, I would have built a model, like a Venn diagram, pushing those two together. So is the product winning over the service? Or is the service winning over the product? And what do the things actually come together? And what is better for the consumer? And what is better for the marketeer, or the producer, or the designer? Where do you want to go? So we thought, okay, fine, we're at this stage. What does that mean? Why service at all? What do we, you know, what's the benefit? What's the gain of it? Um, and then my colleague said, okay, products lead to dead ends. What does it mean? It means that if you think about how the future will evolve, you can make a lot more with the service from, well, the company perspective at least. I'm sorry I couldn't pull it through. I didn't want to have an Apple example. I wanted to be, you know, just have one presentation once where you don't say something about Apple, but apparently it didn't work out this time either. But if you think about the image of the naked iPhone, let's say you have an iPhone and there's nothing on it, and then it's a product, fine. What happens when you have all the cool things you were talking about, you have all your apps on here, what is it then? Is it a service or is it still a product? Of course it's something physical, something tangible, something I hold in my hand, but it's much more than that. And this is what makes this device super sexy and successful and smart because it actually bridges the gap between doop, 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 the bridges this gap quite clearly and becomes something much more. Um, so we said, okay, services create opportunities and this is why we're actually interested in them. And this is because what you said, Color, that services kind of engage people. And at the end of the day, it's all about people and nothing else. So this is an elevator shaft. Um, as you can see, it's really messy. I think there's a broken ass right here. There's a receipt. There's something else running around. And the person who cleans this is this guy. And he works for a very big company called ThyssenKrupp for the elevator department. And he goes around and he cleans those elevators. Um, what they actually sell is this. They sell the construction. They sell the kind of steel product they put in. And people go up and down with it. But they make the most money with that guy because he goes there and he cleans it and he takes care of it. So he is a service provider for a physical object that you purchased, but you buy into the whole contract and the whole network of things that kind of flow together. So that's the key to how they make most of their business, except for, you know, also selling steel, obviously. Um, so then we thought, okay, what does it mean in general? And what makes a service good? What makes a service great? Because, you know, eventually, as you say, if you want to have a kind of line and integrate all people together, you don't want to offer them a bland service. You want to have them a service that kind of distinguishes from everything you know, that your competitors offer and how you kind of lead things together. So my colleague said, okay, 
Servicewüste, a very German term for, you know, being the worst service ever, which I think Germany kind of leads the way at some points. So, <laughs> I'm Greek actually, so Greece is actually, no, no. <laughs> but that's not, not good, in, I shouldn't have said that, let's not go into that. So, Servicewüste, I spent the first three weeks of this year in Alabama, and I was dreadfully looking, oh, I don't want to go to Alabama, it must be terrible, but you know what, it was lovely because people were friendly, everywhere they were polite everywhere and it was the best service i'd experienced even better than the bigger cities so why can we not simply as that get away from this because this is service hell and you don't want to be there so good service is when you're allowed to shout at someone he said that so that means that if i can actually pull that off it means that i have the network that i'm as comfortable with someone that i can actually just relax and feel at ease and he will just say okay it's fine don't worry about it, you're going to be fine, just continue. And then he will be able to adjust how I think or how I don't. So the key to, as all things comes back to the human, as we we're saying, is being empathic. Being empathic means that the person who actually provides me with the service can understand what I want, who I am, and give it to me at the right time. So um, this is an example from the Victuali Markt. It is about a, a workshop we did for a telecommunications company a couple of uh, months or years ago. And we sent them on a workshop, we sent them on a the mission. They wanted to redesign a part of the service business, and they didn't know how. And we said, okay. They came to Gravity for a day. We planned this workshop, and they had to go out, go to Victualian Markt, and kind of engage with people there, and kind of find out, uh, find out about a few things. So they had to shop a very specific thing to build a kind of recipe, a paste line. So they didn't know what it was. They didn't know how it worked. They didn't know what to do. They went there. They talked to this guy. This guy charmed the bits out of him. He was polite, he was friendly, he could assist them with buying more. He upsold the whole thing for a recipe, he sold them groceries for the home, and he actually managed to convince them that in 10 minute conversation you can have the best service experience than from a whole network of systemized tellers that you have uh, in your own business center. So this guy can provide a great service apparently. Um, a great service, we said, has to be transparent. And transparent um, in the sense that um, this is about a different project. And actually, that's not a thing you want to see, but this is someone's uh, iPad in here, probably. So when you order something from Amazon, you kind of feel good about it because you know you can trace it. So whenever you log in, you see that you, you know, your parcel is in Schwäbisch Gmünd, Logistics Center 1, and then it's in Koblenz, and then it's there. So whatever happens, the service is interactive, so it gives you feedback, and it kind of engages you in the things that are happening, and that gives you comfort. So this is a very important thing, we thought. And then a good service always has to balance needs and expectations, what you said previously, because we have to understand what happens with the person at the core. Um, this is the bar in Alabama. It's called Cook's Corner. So imagine you go in here. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's all these bikers hanging around in leather jackets. And then a waiter steps up and says, hi, I'm John. I'm your waiter. How can I help you tonight? I have a specialist. No, you kind of expect there to have sleazy service. So you go in, you go like, beer, beer. This is the maximum of communication that happens there, right? So if you actually have, um, let's say, if you have that service, selling, talking, convincing you, in this place, it doesn't work well. So there is no manual and there is no recipe you can apply and say, okay, check, be polite, check, be friendly, you know, check, be nice to people. Because here, you know, the rockers will say, I'm gonna go to some other place, the guy's way too friendly for me, it doesn't work out. <laughs> um, and you need all those things in the mix at the right time, because if you don't have it at the right time, there is no point. This is Juanita. Um, we did a very interesting project with her. Uh, she was one of the respondents, and she's talking to, uh, on the other thing here, there's a big device we're building, and she was talking to something happening there. And, and we expected, you know, as normal, that we want to have people um, who kind of prepared for this conversation to be professional and sleek and say, how are you doing, and engage them and be polite. And after them, all the people said, you know, she was really enjoying that, but the guy, could he be more efficient? Because what she was looking in that scenario, you know, in that kind of financial services world, she wanted something like this. She didn't want to engage in anything else and waste any more time as necessary. So for her, that service was very different than all the other service engagements. And finally, um, a service is very, 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 very fragile. So you can break it, make it or break it in about nothing. I'm sorry we can't see this. This is another delivery guy um, who's holding a parcel and delivering it to the front door of someone. 
So imagine you order something very exciting for Christmas for your daughter and you're waiting for it, you know, maybe something pricey as well. And then a delivery guy shows up and he's in a really, really grumpy mood. What does it make you feel about the whole service? Now, Amazon put all this effort into it, designing a perfect logistical center or Pret-a-Porter. They even bought the chain so they can be sure that it gets to your doorstep right away. But the guy's a grumpy guy, you know, what do you do? What happens if you go to the Apple store and you want to buy something really precious and the guy's just having a bad day and he lets it out on you? How does it make you feel about the service? The end bit, the little tiny bit you have left on your service can just break the whole experience. So you have to kind of take care of all the components. So we thought about how do we do it? Um, and we had kind of the same conversation you know, that you were saying previously. Um, I said, well, I don't think I've ever worked in a service project. My colleague said, of course you have. You've done this and this and this and this. Oh, right. And then we realized that 60, 70% of our project right now are service-related projects, which we have never thought at that sense. And even purely so, very, very 100% projects rated on service. So we have our design thinking process, which you, know, you all know about. Um, which is relatively generic, but what we do is um, kind of talking to people, we try to involve everyone every time. So it doesn't matter that if you have a service and you talk to one person who's at the end and you talk about your end customer, you want to talk to everyone. You want to talk to the architect who builds the house, the planner who does the plumbing, um, uh, the plumber who installs the plumbing, the site manager, the guy who actually gets the house at the end, and the contractor. So. If you talk to everyone in the loop, you know what everyone feels about service and what the connection points are between them. Because you never know who the customer will face, and you always have different people being engaged in that process. Um, measuring the intangible, that's a bit, you know, taken by the head, though. Um, if you go to China and you pass by the immigration, um, you have a little device where you can rate the service directly. So you give your passport, you say, okay, bye, and you have this bucket, and it says the number you are, and then you can say, you don't really say, there's four smiley faces, you know, super happy, come was a ride, oh, okay, and I hated it. So you rate the service, rate the person instantly, just by pressing a button. Of course, it's an unrealistic way of doing so, but you have to find a way of kind of how bringing things together and how they work. And, excuse me, what we do a lot is we prototype. If you don't prototype, usually things kind of don't work out at the end. So this is my colleague, Vicky. And she's building a cardboard model for a video camera. And just doing this exercise in a couple of steps and a couple of iterations later, we immediately understood that this doesn't work. <laughs> and we learned it by, you know, it took us five minutes to build the cardboard, write the security camera, write the emergency push here, and play the exercise once, role play. And we knew that it's not going to work. Because for that scenario, well, it was actually for an elevator, it wasn't real. Um, and then listen to your gut, because most of the things in terms of service, because they are intangible and because you can't actually approach them, are a bit in between. So all, all of us have good and bad experiences, and we kind of learn from those, and we know how they kind of approach us in the right way. So this is a guy who works for Bofrost, and he has a very, very hard job. He drives around all day, and he delivers people with food and supplies, and he has to upsell to them. Every time he has to go to a door and be nice to them because they're really trying to make an honest living. So he has to upsell you more food every time. So that guy has been in the business for 20, 25, 30 years. So he knows instantly every house on his route. He has about 6,000 routes you know, throughout the year. He knows every person and he knows what to sell you or not. He knows if you're in a good mood instantly. He knows if you're going to buy ice cream or he knows if you're going to buy, I don't know, chicken wings at that day. So he has that intuition. So he can instantly kind of use your feedback and kind of go back and forward without doing much of a hassle. Um, and then, well, the most important thing, um, how you actually can relate all that stuff back on your brand and how can you make your brand look distinguishable and good and not be bland service compared to others. So this is not a very fresh example, but it's JetBlue. It was a kind of airline company that had a very, very fresh kind of tonality. You know, this said, at the terminals, it was hello and how you doing and can I help you and you kind of approach them. So you knew whatever you were engaged, even if you go to the website, that they were very distinguishable in the way they kind of approach you. Um, and something we talk about a lot later is how when you take the service, you can take it to the next level. So most of the services are standard in the sense that they're about doing things yourself and kind of not engaging you in a new way. But we think about services that can be premium. So how do you actually get people to actually 
do something for other people and kind of engage them in some better experiences. And finally, sometimes good service is invisible. And I think this is what really makes good service. If it works perfectly, you shouldn't really notice what it's about and what's happening there. So um, the hotel room example is um, you have your room and it's all neat and you come, you know, you come in after a day in Paris, walking about, and you find this little mint on your pillow. And the mint says, someone was here, took care of your room, cleaned everything, but we you know we didn't make a fuss about it. So everything worked while you were away. So you don't really see it. Thank you very much. <laughs>